I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about Turkey's presidential election, we have with us Dr. Bülent Aliriza, my longtime colleague and one of the most astute observers of what's going on in Turkey anywhere. Bülent, thanks for being here. So Erdogan was reelected. What does this mean for Turkey and for the United States? Well, for Turkey, it underlines Erdogan's absolute domination of the Turkish political system that he has refashioned uh, into a presidential system, basically designed for him to rule on his own and with uh, with uh, chosen colleagues, and having got vindication from uh, from the Turkish electorate, he dominates Turkish politics like a colossus, and he has been using a magic formula for winning elections that involves, you know, appealing to the piety of the of the Muslim Turks appealing to their nationalism and uh, their sense of belonging to a nation that is more important in the world than ever before. You know, shades of the Ottoman Empire and, and legacy is very strong in his, in his arguments. And they proved, you know, effective, you know, with the majority of Turkish people who voted for him, despite the economic difficulties, despite the post-earthquake problems, and he will uh, continue to lead Turkey until and unless somebody else comes along with a similar message and beats him on his chosen field of, of, of battle. As for the United States, it will mean a continuation of the transactional relationship with a difficult ally, as Tony Blinken characterized Turkey during a Senate foreign relations uh, uh, testimony. There are difficulties ahead, many of them uh, stemming you know, from the previous decade when issues arose between the two countries, most notably the admission of Sweden, which is priority number one for, for the U.S. It remains to be seen what exactly this alliance really means for both countries. So, Bjorn, does this effectively mean Erdogan's going to be ruler for life? Yeah, but not in the way that other rulers for life have ruled over different uh, countries in the Central Asia, Africa, and elsewhere. He does believe in the national will, in order to uh, get reaffirmation of the national will in elections, he does use all the resources of the state, and it's an uneven playing field for, for the opposition. But, you know, for the foreseeable future, unless something untoward happens to him or something unexpected happens in Turkish politics, yes, he, he will be the leader of Turkey for the foreseeable future. So the New York Times noted that the vote was, quote, free but not fair. What do you make of that statement? Does that go to the point that you were just making about the opposition having a disadvantage? Exactly. I mean, it's free in the sense that people go to the polls without somebody telling them this is the way that you should vote. Now, there were some irregularities in the election, but not enough to cause the opposition to cry foul that, uh, that this was a fix, fixed election, unlike in Russia and many other places around the world. It wasn't fair in the sense that uh, the opposition did not get a chance to use the media to spread his message. Erdogan did, as I said, use the assets of the of the state to his advantage. And Erdogan's message, negative messages against the uh, the opposition, which in essence def helped define Kılıçdaroğlu in, in a manner that made him unacceptable to huge parts of the of the population. Uh, was something that he could do because, you know, of his domination of the uh, the airwaves. And that was not available to the opposition. So, Bjorn, how would you evaluate the state of democracy in Turkey following this election? It isn't what it was when Erdogan used the democratic system to come to power in uh, 2002. A party that was vilified by the majority of the media that was seen as an outsider, was able to win power and has been able to dominate Turkish politics for two decades. But Erdogan's former colleagues who have defected and joined other parties or, you know, are sitting on the sidelines could testify this is not what the AKP had in mind when it entered the fray and won the elections in 2002. You know, the democratic dilemma here is that, uh, that Erdogan came to power with his AKP democratically but he has ensured that he does dominate the democratic system in a way 
that ensures that he wins election after election after election. So looking ahead, what are the major challenges and issues that Turkey will face during Erdogan's new term in office? I know there's some pretty big economic ones coming on the horizon. That's the big one. During the election campaign, uh, the voters preferred not to look at the, the economic difficulties, which the opposition expected to get them to vote for the opposition instead of to Erdogan, during whose uh, term in office the economic difficulties had got worse. Instead, they chose to look to Erdogan as perhaps, paradoxically, as the man who could help solve those problems. Now, the Turkish current account deficit, the trade deficit are, are bad. The inflation rate is, is very high. Erdogan's unorthodox policies have pretty much ensured that foreign investors who used to flock to Turkey are no longer coming. And Erdogan has to decide whether he continues down this, the, this path or he brings in people uh, who'd worked for him in the past who would pursue what would be characterized as more orthodox, more conventional policies and perhaps reduce the inflation rate, raise the interest rate to more realistic uh, levels and somehow stop the slide and the blood hitting with the national currency, the Turkish lira, against the dollar. Mr. Erdogan was able to keep the Turkish lira below the symbolically important 20 Turkish liras to the dollar prior to the elections by getting the central bank to sell massive amounts of foreign currency. Since the election, the Turkish lira has slipped below 20, and there are some people in and out of Turkey who focus on these things who say that it could be 25 or even higher very soon. Now, the Turkish debt burden is obviously going to get higher and heavier as the Turkish lira slips, and Erdogan will now have to concentrate on the, on the economy. He pushed that to, to one side uh, in the minds of people as he won the election, but that's got to be at the top of the agenda now. Bulan, as you pointed out, Secretary Blinken said that Turkey is a difficult ally. Nonetheless, President Biden called Erdogan to congratulate him. There's a lot of issues before the United States and Turkey, including Sweden's application to NATO, foreign military sales from the United States to Turkey. What are some of the issues that Biden and Erdogan talked about, and what do you see on the horizon of that relationship? President Biden himself addressed his conversation with uh, President Erdogan and said that Mr. Erdogan had raised the F-16 sale, which the administration wants, but which Congress opposes. And uh, Biden also stressed to Erdogan the importance of letting Sweden join NATO as soon as possible, and ideally, although he didn't say that, before the Vilnius summit um, of NATO, which is coming up uh, the, this summer. You know, the Swedish issue uh, application, and before that, the Finnish uh, application, which were really prompted by the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, were new issues uh, in the U.S.-Turkish uh, relationship. Turkey opposed the Finnish application before allowing Finland to join just before the Turkish elections. Sweden is still opposing on the grounds that Sweden lacks towards uh, Kurdish terrorism, which threatens Turkey. But these were new issues. There were other issues on the agenda, most notably Turkey's purchase of the S-400 missile system, which had led Turkey being pushed by Congress uh, out of the F-35 program, of which it was a founding state. The F-16 program, that is uh, the alternative that the U administration put forward, additional F-16s to Turkey and upgrading the existing F-16s in, in Turkey. But Congress, which has increasingly emerged as a factor in the U.S.-Turkish relationship and a negative factor, opposing the administration's desire to continue to work with Turkey, even though Turkey poses a problem for the U.S. in so many issues, they are concerned about uh, Turkey's foreign policy, Turkey's closeness to, to Russia. They're also concerned with uh, what's going on in, in Turkey. And the administration of President Biden has been keeping Turkey at arm's length, uh, preferring to deal with Turkey on a transactional basis. I doubt that's going to change in the remaining year or so of the, uh, the Biden administration. Mr. Erdogan had a very good relationship with Mr. Trump when uh, Trump was president. And I think he would not uh, deny that uh, that you know he wouldn't mind seeing him back at the at the White House during the campaign. He complained about uh, Biden publicly, naming uh, uh, President Biden as being the force behind the opposition, which was you know running against him. And after the election, he said that he didn't just defeat the opposition, but defeated the forces behind the opposition. You know, in allusion, uh, clearly, in, in allusion to uh, to Mr. Biden. 
I don't think there's going to be a, a, a quick improvement of the relationship uh, at all. There may be a meeting on the sidelines of the Vilnius summit between uh, the two presidents. But even if the administration was to ease up uh, on its attitude towards Turkey, Congress will still continue to oppose Turkey uh, in the way that it did before, creating a problem for the administration. Is there any changing that in Congress or is it pretty set? Pretty set. And I don't think that the election result is, is going to cha change too many minds in a positive direction as far as uh, looking at Turkey. So you mentioned the United States is going to have a transactional relationship going forward over the next year at least. What does the United States do with the fact that Erdogan, a NATO ally, is cozy with Putin, is giving us some issues that we don't need right now? What does the United States do with that? It's a great question. Now, the Treasury has long been focused on Turkey and, uh, and Turkish firms and individuals allowing Russia to sidestep sanctions. There were visits by three important treasury officials, but nonetheless, the U.S. did not move against uh, Turkey with possible secondary sanctions before the election in the belief that that would be used by Mr. Erdogan against the United States. Uh, now that the elections are over, I think that issue is going to come up again, and there is a real possibility that Turkey could face secondary sanctions for dealing with, uh, with Russia. Clearly, Turkey's attitude on sanctions is important to, to Russia, and it's therefore important to the United States and to the NATO allies that were hoping that the sanctions against Russia would squeeze Putin and undermine his ability to maintain the war against Ukraine. Now, with the likelihood that Ukraine is about to launch a, a counteroffensive backed by the, uh, the NATO allies, Turkey will become an even more odd man out in the alliance maintaining a good relationship with uh, Russia. Mr. Erdogan called Putin his friend, and Putin reciprocated by calling Erdogan dear friend when uh, he congratulated him on the, on the election. So that's the next issue I think that's going to come up in, uh, in the relationship. And Turkey will no doubt be angry if and when secondary sanctions are imposed. But Turkey's allies, including the United States, are obviously angry at uh, Turkey for maintaining a relationship with Russia. And the question that has to be asked increasingly is, you know, how firm is the alliance relationship that Mr. Biden talked about between the United States and Turkey, between other NATO allies and, and, and Turkey, and how far can Turkey and Russia continue to maintain this relationship without undermining Turkey's own relationship with NATO? Bula and Ali Riza, thank you very much for helping us make sense of this election. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 